Hey there, Steve Layden here, and in this video I'll be talking about passive solar and energy use in my compact natural home. I've employed a number of smart design features that combine with thermal mass in the floor and highly insulated walls to create an exceptionally comfortable house that has super low energy bills. The heating and cooling systems are super simple and affordable, so it's truly dumb technology. So come along and I'll educate you about energy efficient passive solar design. The first and best thing anyone can do to save energy is to build small. I'm not talking as small as my house, but maybe you've already been thinking about downsizing. In addition to using fewer resources to build, an efficient, compact house is easier to heat and cool. As an aside, my favorite benefit from compact living is the simplicity and time savings from having less space to clean and maintain, but that's a different topic. If you don't plan to downsize, or you just plain need a larger house, it's still a good idea to zone the HVAC so you can avoid heating and cooling spaces that are not in use, and definitely take advantage of passive solar to reduce your energy bills. Here are the basic principles of passive solar design. First, orient your house with the long dimension running east-west so the longer side faces south. Second, place the most windows on the south wall and place the fewest on the north wall. East and west would be in between. Third, shade your windows to exclude direct summer sunlight while still letting in winter sun energy. Shading can be permanent overhangs, temporary awnings, vegetation, or any number of creative solutions. Fourth, use low E coatings on your windows and tune them based on your climate. I'll get into more details on all these topics throughout the video. On the interior, Lay out the rooms with living spaces along the south wall and service spaces along the colder north wall. By service spaces, I mean stairs, cabinets, closets, and bathrooms. And here's a quick note about bathrooms. I like this to be the warmest room in the house, which doesn't always work out too well in the winter. I end up using a portable heater or overhead heating combined with the exhaust fan. This way, you only use the extra energy when you're actually in the room rather than heating up the entire house just to make that one room comfortable. Here's a little more detail about house orientation. Generally speaking, if you can keep your south-facing wall pointed to within 10 degrees of due south, you'll be maximizing your winter energy capture. I chose to point my house about 12 degrees east of south which gives me more solar gain on winter mornings to help warm up the downstairs after a cold night. This also warms up the porch faster, so it's possible to enjoy lunch or 4 o'clock tea all winter long on days when the sun is strong. Here's a technical tip. Be aware of the difference between true north and magnetic north. I've included a link in the description below so you can find out what the difference or declination is at your location. This map gives you a rough idea of what I mean. And FYI, Google Earth shows true north by default. I'll bet you already know that the sun is higher in the sky around the summer solstice in June as compared to the winter solstice in December. And shout out to my southern hemisphere friends who have the reverse. I use this to my advantage by designing the south side roof overhang in combination with the rain handlers to automatically shade the south side windows in the summer. I shot time-lapse videos to show the seasonal difference and this one from June 30th takes place between 12.30 and 1.30. Notice how far down the wall the shadow falls, and those windows never see any direct sun for the remainder of the day. This time lapse from January 7th shows the sun on the house all day from about 7 until 2.30 when the garage shadow covers the wall. Inside, the sun sneaks in under the overhangs and falls on the thermal slab, which captures that energy rather than overheating the room. Thermal mass is my favorite dump technology, and few houses take this into account. My 6 inch thick adobe floor and clay plaster walls even out the interior temperature and store heat from the daytime to be released at night. It's a little less noticeable, but the sun moves horizontally throughout the seasons as well as vertically. These screenshots are from the Sun Surveyor app on my phone, 
which is really handy to see where the sun will be located in the sky on any particular day and time of the year. On long summer days, the sun rises and sets further to the north. On the March and September equinoxes, the sun rises exactly in the east and sets exactly in the west. In winter, the sun tracks more to the south. I used these seasonal trends in two ways. By placing the house in the shadow of the trees to the east and west, I get some free shade on the house in summer. This reduces heat gain in the early morning and late evening, which are harder to screen because of the low sun angles. My porch roof does a good job of excluding direct sunlight from the front door in early to mid-afternoon. As evening approaches, the sun might shine under the roof and hit the house, except that by then, shade from the trees blocks it. This floor plan shows how the light would enter the house one hour after sunrise in the summer, and this one shows one hour before sunset. Of course, these both neglect the adjacent trees, which actually block all direct sunlight at these times. Note that the west facade will experience more summer heat gain compared to the east facade because outside temperatures are lower in the morning as compared to the evening. That means you get more bang for your buck by shading the west facade compared to the east. Now look at the sun angles on the winter solstice. With the days much shorter, sunrise is about 7.20 compared to 5.40 in the summer. See how the light streams in the south windows to begin warming up the house? Winter sunset is about 4.45 compared to 8.30 on the summer solstice. So with the leaves off the trees, the porch gets good sun all afternoon except for when the garage gets in the way. And that only happens a few weeks either side of the solstice. Ideally, a passive solar house would never be shaded in winter by keeping a clear view of the sky to the southeast, south, and southwest. While on the topic of the porch, I wanted to talk about a seasonal feature of this space. So right now it's September and I've got screens in on this entire west wall. The north side is solid glass and then these adjustable screens. So around about the end of October when it starts getting cool, I'll replace the screens with um, PVC plastic, which lets in a ton of light as the sun is setting down to the west. I can adjust the, the amount of ventilation I get if it's a little warmer or if it's super cold. Like even in the dead of the winter, I can close that up and it's a real greenhouse environment in here and it'll warm up to 75, 70 degrees, somewhere in that range pretty easily. I can either sit out here and enjoy lunch or I can open up the door, blow that heat into the house to get a little free energy. So I call it a three and a half season porch because you get the normal three seasons, although summer is debatable in Maryland. It's not comfortable out here a lot of the time. Um, but then you get an extra half season the way I see it in the wintertime when you get a nice day, you get some enjoyment out here. Here are some basics about low E window coatings. This is another of the most important dumb technologies because these coatings can prevent heat movement into or out of your home. I chose Marvin windows because they have a range of low E that can be used to tune the windows on each side of the house. On the south side, I have their least restrictive coating so I can harvest as much high wavelength solar energy as possible, but prevent the escape of low wavelength heat from the inside of the house. On the north side, there's no solar energy to harvest, so the most restrictive low E coating simply blocks as much heat as possible from entering or exiting. I also use the same type for the attic east and west walls since I want to minimize heat gain in the summer, but I don't need to harvest winter energy since heat passively rises up from the first floor. The first floor east window coating and the door are basically in between, which means I have three different levels of low E throughout the house. One final piece of advice, buy the best windows you can afford. Not only will they be more efficient if you have low E coatings, multiple panes or films, and thermally broken frames, but they will seal better. Air infiltration is the single most critical aspect of an energy efficient house, so making sure the windows seal properly is critical. Better windows will last much longer as well, so the higher upfront price really makes sense if you consider the life cycle cost. I'd like to mention that most of the passive solar design practices I described also relate to solar photovoltaics placed on the roof, in Maryland, the optimum roof angle is around 30 to 40 degrees, or about an 8 and 12 roof pitch, plus or minus. Steeper is better as you move north, and flatter is better to the south. If you're curious, my roof has an 8 and 12 pitch. 
Personally, I opted not to install solar PV at my place because the roof area was too small to replace my electric usage and my garage is shaded in the afternoon. I ended up signing with a community-based solar program through Nexamp. I won't get into the details of that. You can read about how it works on their website with a link provided below. In short, I get the environmental benefits of solar power without having to own or lease a system installed on my property. I don't have hard numbers, but checking my bills before and after I signed up, there was no discernible change to what I pay for electricity. There's no harm in looking around to see if there's a source of solar power available in your location, either community-based or a dedicated solar option through the electric utility. I'll touch quickly on my radiant heating system. The thermal mass in the 6 inch thick adobe floor is doubly important in my home because of the hot water pipes embedded in the middle. Radiant in a small house lends itself to simplicity, with only a single loop arranged in a spiral that touches the bathroom, closet, and main living space. My heat source is a bare bones 20 gallon water heater with an upgraded 3500 watt heating element. The hot water is pumped through the floor to create a gentle, even heat that supplements the passive solar. The system includes an expansion tank, pressure gauge, and a pump with the pipes diving into the floor. This may look complicated, but it's a very straightforward system to operate and maintain. In fact, the only thing I've had to do after seven heating seasons is to replace a defective temperature sensor. I love that the system is almost silent with just a little hum when the pump is on. Unlike forced air, there is no lukewarm breeze that makes you feel cold in winter, and you don't have to worry about what's growing in your ducts. With warm feet on the adobe floor, it's easy to keep the rest of your body comfortable with radiant. In fact, practically my entire first floor radiates warmth, which is a game changer in terms of winter comfort. My house is small enough that the single window air conditioner unit is all I need to keep cool throughout the summer. I upgraded to a dual inverter model this year, and it's the quietest window air conditioner unit available today. I'll hold my microphone right up next to it while it starts up to give you a sense for how quiet it actually is. I'll talk just a little bit to give you a baseline for what my voice sounds like compared to what the air conditioner sounds like as it starts up. Here it goes. Well there you have it. That's all I needed to keep cool over the summer even with heat indices up around 110 on a few days. I never had to go above this lowest fan speed. I'm a fan. Check out these in-process construction shots while I talk about my energy usage. Personally, I like manipulating the windows and shades to control heat gain and natural cooling in order to minimize my energy bills. It keeps me connected to the outside world and it's important to me to reduce my footprint on the earth. Without much effort, I get several weeks in the spring and fall where I'm not spending any money on heating or cooling. Remember swing season days when the heat comes on in the morning but you're switching over to AC by the afternoon? That never happens in my house because the thermal mass flattens out those temperature swings. One of my goals in designing and building this house was to minimize my carbon footprint. I'll talk about that in terms of the construction details in another video, but here I'll mention that everything about this house is electric to minimize the use of fossil fuels. That applies to heat, hot water, and cooking on the induction stove. My electric bills vary from about $20 in the spring and fall to $75 in the dead of winter or the hottest months of summer when heating and cooling demands are the highest. Overall, my bills average about $50 per month or $600 per year for around 2,900 kilowatt hours of electricity used. Not bad for one person, eh? In wrapping up, I have to say this is hands down the most comfortable house I've ever spent any meaningful amount of time in. 
It's fulfilling to know that I'm doing my part to preserve our planet, but more importantly, living simply and compactly has allowed me to spend more time and energy doing the things that are important to me. And it's not a bad benefit that I'm saving money on my utility bills too. I hope this has provided you with some new information or at least food for thought. It really helps if you like this video and please subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching!